Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Heroes of the Storm North American Regional here for uh, fall as we get into what is to be our winner's match here from Group B as it is story time with Kyle Aris. The story of Tyrrell persists here at the Fall Regional. Uh, I am joined by our lovely members of the panel here, Mr. Dunk, Dunk, and of course, Jake. I'm never gonna I'm get so it wrong proud again. Of you. I'm so proud of you. I swore to myself in my head, if I get it wrong, I'm gonna shave my mustache off. So uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna get it wrong <laughs> today. You know, you know, last year during the road to BlizzCon, I actually did a Skype call with Dread, and I said, Dunkus, what's up? So we're, we're right? equally as bad with those two. I don't know why it is so easy to do, but anyway. Of course, let's look at the brackets, see what has gone on throughout the day so far, uh, with our two teams now moving on into our winner's match. It will indeed be Gale Force Esports going up against Vox Nihili in just a little bit. Uh, in my mind, it should have been 3-0 to Vox Nihili after that first game, but that is the case. And then, of course, down to the bottom, we have Team Name Change going up against Ghoul Dan's Game, uh, as that will be an elimination match to see who goes out of the tournament soon. All right, but st we start things off now with our winner's match. It will be Gale Force Esports, who looked very strong and competent in their first series, and they're going up against Vox Nihili, um, a team that, well, by my own heart, have already said they loved European meta, and I'm okay with that. You've got, they're gonna win this one, guys. Don't worry about that. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but of course, <laughs> GFE, very, very powerful here in Group B. Definitely, definitely. Coming to the tournament, I mean, they're one of the favorites, yeah. obviously, champions at the last regional. So they looked amazing in their first set. That's not even arguable. They looked great in their first set. Vox and Healy, on the other hand, Struggled a lot with Gul'dan's game. Gul'dan's game, we thought that was going to be an excellent team coming to this event, mm -hmm. but it seems like the star power rosters haven't actually performed that well relative to the longtime right. teams that have just been playing together. I mean, we saw some pretty standard drafts just in general for what they, we wanted to see out of the side of Gul'dan's game, but Vox and Nihili, they busted out some unique things. I mean, we saw the Falling Sword and Johanna, and it paired very well with the Engage of Tyr going in with Aldurin's Might dropping that uh, sanctification and just enabling really safe fights for them in the middle of that battle. So, you know, obviously, Gale Force has shown they can do crazy things too, but I'm actually super pumped just to see exactly how these two teams try to mind games each other in the draft. Yeah, we're going to look at Vox and Hilly a little bit um, specifically more first here. And I think that they could have even had a, a better series in the previous one. Had they just kind of neatened up a few things, identified a few things. Even in that third game, we, we clearly spotted that, you know, the Illidan was going very happy on Arthas for a long time during those things, which is like the least uh, likely target he wants to be taking in those games. Absolutely. We saw multiple times the Illidan for pretty much the whole majority of the game was just focus firing Arthas. Yeah, yeah. And it proved really difficult for them because he drew so many resources that it cost his team on the other sides of the fight. And then later in the game, he finally figured it out. And I think that's a good sign for them. If you can figure out your mistakes in game and transition yeah. and change your play style, that speaks well to your ability to adapt and also suggests that maybe they're getting over some of their land jitters, which could be a problem for a team first time in a big land environment, a lot of those players. And it's an even bigger deal that they've now proven that they can take a map. I just remember seeing the coach shaking them like on the shoulder, like you guys did it. I can't believe you took down Gul'dan's game. Everyone was saying Gul'dan's game was the favorite. So, so to be able to move forward here, now they have that new confidence, but it's gonna be tough with Gale Force. Yeah, Gale Force is kind of in a similar vein to what we saw yesterday from Team Neventic. They're probably the team that is gonna be on another level here unless we see something yeah. quite miraculous out of the other teams today. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at Gale Force now. And what really stands out for you at the moment? Has B-Kid integrated well for you, Jake? It, uh, who is the real standout for you? Yeah, no, B-Kid looks rock solid here in every element for the team, but just the fact that they've gone to the drawing table and said, we're not just gonna play the game, we're gonna play our own game, create our own meta, busting right. out the, the whole Abathur Tassadar Leoric. And you know, I talked to God, I talked to Raffle and I talked to wow. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Michael Oodle after that game, and they said we have so much more left in our bag of tricks. That's not even the tip of the iceberg. I totally agree with you. I think Gale Force has historically shown they are the new We Play Off Meta team in North America now that Cloud9 has stepped down. So You are so salty. <laughs> stepped down. Step, on, step down. Gracefully stepped Just down. Gracefully, <laughs> gracefully stepped down. resigned, one might say. <laughs> right anyway, <there>. anyway. <laughs> They have shown that they are really excellent at playing various strategies. The Asmodean was something they're really known for. Yep. They've drafted a really wide amount of styles along with having deep hero pools on their own. So it just fits them perfectly that they would do that kind of weird thing not many teams know how to deal with. And then the fact that they can also play standard 
and excel with that is just icing on the cake. Yeah. And it's interesting they actually mentioned that because if this game does go to a full three games, which I'm not expecting too much, but Blackout's Bay is the third map. Oh no. And we all know how that can go. Of course, our first game will be on Cursed Hollow, which, you know, can have its own surprises here and there anyway. We saw how GFE was able to run that very uh, impressive composition on Cursed Hollow in their second game going up against TNC. Are we likely to see something similar to that? Or do you think that we're gonna see um, Vox Nihili go in, anticipate that and maybe react? Well, I mean, even in Michael Udall's interview, he said, we want to scare the team. So they're throwing that threat on the table. Mm. I don't know if they'll directly go for it, but it's definitely an option based on, you know, what they see in the early portions of the draft out of Vox Nahili. Why not? They, should, they made it look unbeatable. They really did. All right, well, we're just waiting for the draft in just a little moment here between these two teams. Of course, the winner will be moving on into the semi-final. And make sure to join the conversation over on Twitter as well with the hashtag HGC. Make sure to tweet us at ESL Heroes as well as at Heroes Esports and tell us who you think is going to be winning this series, winning this game, and moving on, all importantly. Now, GFE here... Of course, they've got a lot of potential stuff up their sleeve. We're going to get into draft number one for this best of three series to find out exactly what is going to be the case. And that is our first Illidan ban of the tournament. No surprises, though. Yeah, very early Illidan ban. Box Melee has to be terrified of the Illidan Abather composition on Cursed Hollow specifically to ban that first. Well, I mean, actually, Gale Force, both of their games earlier today had Illidan as the primary source of damage for their composition. So they know Michael Udall is not only warmed up, but scary on that hero. Just get rid of him. Definitely, definitely. The Grey Main follow up ban by, Vo by Gale Force Esports against Vox Nihili, leaving open the Falstad. Now, We've seen much more Falstad today than we saw yesterday. Mm. He seems to be slipping past the van phase and into the pick phase more frequently. But Gale Force made it look good when they played against it. Yeah. Box Nihili used it pretty well in that Sky Temple game. So I don't know, I like that first pick. All right, what are Gale Force gonna pick up? Normally, uh, it will give us a little bit of an indic- Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That was, that was close to the hair. That was too close to the glorious hair there of Crowen. I actually thought it was Sia Steve's beard at first. Oh, you and did? then I realized it was actually Crowen's beautiful ah, fro. Because of the red light behind it emanating mm. through. I see. All right, Zagara is going to be their first pick up here. Uh, maybe an ETC? Mm -hmm. Could be an ETC. Could be an ETC. If we did see the ETC, I would like to see the Maw comboed with the yeah, ETC yeah. just because we've seen that be so backbreaking. And the Nidus Network. We've seen it fail now once or twice, so it's not always the game changer that it has been in the first place, especially when you pair it with ETC, the Maw just has so much potential for team fighting rather than needing to play that run around split game. Yeah. I'll go as far to say that I've only actually been impressed with the Nidus Network in the hands of Coffin Luck because, I mean, although it has a great impact to be able to just go across the map and have that global presence to respond to someone like Falstad, Maw can just outright win games. And Nidus, yeah. you know, can earn you opportunities, earn you some soak. That's about it. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's kind of, it's an interesting how it's changed because obviously you need creep on the other side of the map to then place down the Nidus Worm on the other side of the map as well. And when you're on a big map like this, oftentimes you can't get that value because you have to be running between other locations to then set that up and it can be denied pretty easily especially by something like Falstad who has that better global presence. The global presence definitely helps mitigate the Zagara impact. The question I really wanted to ask which I guess Vox just answered was is Tyrael good enough with Gramian out of the game? Mm -hmm. I mean we know Tyrael is a super high value tank. We know Gramian is a really high priority range damage but Gale Force Esports immediately banned the Gramian left open the Tyrael on their own rotation, and Vox and Healy picked it up immediately. So is this an early Sonya? We're looking at the melee assassins that are available, although she's labeled as a warrior. Uh, but with Illid and Greymane both out, Zeratul obviously is definitely another melee assassin, but I'm thinking of a dive buddy to go in with that Tyrael. Mm. Yeah, double warrior, definitely a prominent thing, and Murden could fit in there. But how do you feel about just, just Sonya? Sonya would be sweet here, but I don't think you need to pick it just yet. It is really good with the Tyrael and good against the ETC, but since you have alternatives like the Thrall, perhaps, or even if you have to take another warrior, mm. you can afford to wait and pick up Li Ming, which is that top tier follow up damage. Yeah. I was thinking Thrall as well, but then of course you've got to be careful about how you use your Sundering with the Gust at the same time. Like, you don't want that to become an issue uh, when it comes to timing. So let's see what they're going to go for the bands here. Gale Force Esports e -sports have a few choices. They could try a little bit more of a support choke because they got theirs coming up, but then do you get into that war with Vox Nihili where they then ban a support and he's like, nah, got you. 
Yeah, I don't see a whole lot of, of value for just trying to ban out the supports here, but I actually don't know if they can get a handle on the melees. Maybe they can. Kerrigan has been banned. Mm. Vox and Nahili, if they ban another melee themselves, they're only putting themselves in even more of an awkward position, limiting their options for the next pick. What are you feeling here, Dunk? Well, the Kerrigan really goes well with the ETC, so I'm kind of surprised to see that be the ban choice for Gale Force. I think they're trying to force a Zeratul ban perhaps here because that is kind of scary. The Illidan's already gone. Zeratul's one of the only real game changer melee assassins left that Mike Udall plays. So forcing that ban out by eliminating the Kerrigan opens up the opportunity for them to take their own Sonya or Thrall and then draft around that. Right now, Thrall is a threat to Gale Force because the Sunder is good against Mosh and yep. he's good at handling the Zagar lane, at least early. Sonya would also be good for Vox and Healy because of how good it is with the Tyrael. So Gale Force Esports kind of feels like they're up against the wall here in mm -hmm. terms of which melee assassin they can afford to pick versus give to the other team. So do they want to go for an Uther here as well just for the solidity of uh, Divine Mosh? Or... Whoa, That's early a, Lunara. Yeah, yeah, I'm intrigued. Like, I mean, maybe if you grab Lunara, you try to snag the Rhaegar and then maybe. force them into picking up Uther for that lone support Uther so that their healing is, you know, subpar to deal with the poison being spread everywhere with the splintered spear. Um, but it def definitely seems like unnecessarily early almost. Forcing your opponent into Uther here could be big since some of the best Divine Shield targets are already out of the game. We see Greymane, Kerrigan, Zeratul, Illidan bans. All four of those heroes love getting Divine Shields. So picking up the Lunara Rhaegar, forcing your opponent to either pick uncomfortable supports or an Uther is a pretty good draft manipulation. Now, I think Vox Nihili could pretty easily take Sonya here. Actually, Thrall looks a little better to me. I think Sonya has trouble dealing with the Lunara Zagara push onto the front line. Like, they do yeah. so much damage to that front line while Sonya's trying to trade. I don't think she can win the trade, even though normally it's advantageous against ETC. So I would like to see a Thrall to make the fights faster. And then you can either go Uther for the comfort pick or let's get crazy in here and go like seven-sided strike monk and actually enable some pickoff mm. potential to start up those leap resets on Li Ming. The funny thing is, is both of these teams have been the teams today that have exhibited Lunara play. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know if Vox Nihili would have ended up going for it themselves because it's like Falstad and Li Ming are already there and they would try and get some like comfort around it. And Brightwing's a pretty good response in terms of healer against it. I mean, she fact. deals with the healing over time, but they're going Tracer to try oh. to invade that back mm. line. The first Tracer of the entire tournament. Dunk, you don't look confident in this. I'm not very confident in this composition, Jake. I, I'm i a big fan of Brightwing. I, I think she does get less credit than she deserves in these compositions, but this just isn't the draft where I'm looking like I love the Tracer pickup. Look how squishy Vox Nihili is. You're going to basically try to get Tyrael and Tracer into the back line to kill someone and your Leeming's gonna be left alone, isolated, to get dove on by ETC. You have the Falls that disengage. That doesn't really play well with what Tracer's trying to do. I just feel like this composition got a little weird. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably kind of way to describe it. It's, as you said, you know, there's normally things to compliment Tracer, and that will be Sonya on the other side. It feels like Gale Force Esports roster, their lineup here, just has so much bulk to it. So it's, it's gonna be sturdy and quite difficult to kill off, I think. Right, and, I mean, it's going to be tough. There's there's so much relying on big sanctifications, big emerald wins to get the Sony and ETC off your team, uh, or maybe just using the emerald win to try to stop the, the mall that's just been lined up or something. They do have the options, but I really don't see uh, Blink Hill being enough in this matchup. Did, did you just say Bay emerald wins? Big emerald oh, wins. Oh, okay. I was like, before anyone else emerald wins? I'm like, okay, I mean, yeah, <laughs> if, if, if you really love them that much. I... <laughs> anyway, big emerald wins. All right. I've got I've got an in piece in my ear. I can't hear you half the time. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So those that, that is our draft here. Boys, we're looking down it. I mean, who do you think actually came out on top there? I think GFE is in a good spot, right? I have to agree with you. GFE mm. looks to have an excellent standard style composition draft. Yeah, maybe Lunara's a little weird, but they're basically just running Sonya ETC and a ton of damage sustained. So I love their composition. Yeah, and on the side of Vox, their composition is just a lot harder to execute. There's mm -hmm. so many more variables that have to come into play, and if they can't line things up perfectly, uh, the chance of them winning the fight is, is rough. And I don't see Tracer being that powerhouse in the back line. Pretty much the only way you're going to get a kill here for Vox and Hilly is like a Leeming combo over the wall, 
onto a Rhaegar and Tracer follow up within a second or two. Right. Otherwise, you're just not going to have the damage potential. Is is Tracer in a bad spot? Because the thing is, is that if she's going forwards, she's not going to have really good shields with her unless Tyrael's able to put them on. And then Brightwing's not going to be able to heal her up too easily. And then there's the potential of Lunara just poisoning her while she's dancing around during all of this. Is that is that a problem for her? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we've only seen Tracer be really successful either with a Tassadar yeah. to enable her to go around the backline. She doesn't have one here. So Hosty on Tracer is going to have to make some miracle plays to get the pickoffs in order to win the game. And also just remember, Lunara is starting to see a lot of leaping strike in this meta. I mean, yep. that's going to do monstrous damage to her health pool. It's it's going to be rough. Yes, you do have to be worried. We saw this yesterday with Glowering on Kerrigan, where he got on leaping strike, got pulled into the battle with the Kerrigan mm -hmm. on, on Ravage due to that leaping strike. So similar effects can happen with the Blink of Tracer. All right, thank you very much, guys. We are getting into game number one of our winners match here in Group B. And once again, it will be Gilly and Jehow to guide us through it. Thank you guys, excellent analysis on our game number one drafts, Jay Howe. We finished that crazy last set and I started to pick up my stuff like, wow, that was a great job, we're done. And then I realized we get this set too. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, you've got the big dogs in Gale Force box. They, they, they came out and they won a set. I don't think anybody expected that, but they have a different beast in front of them. This is Gale Force Esports who looked really dominant in their first set. Absolutely, they already got one upset. Can Vox do it again here with this crazy bright wing tracer composition? We are about to find out in game number one as the lanes start getting set up and this top lane push for Gale Force could be very, very strong with Lunara and Zagara. Yeah, Volatile Acid being picked up again by a Zagara on this map. So it could be very reminiscent of what we saw before, but already trying to clear up that creep. That's gonna be the name of the game for Daihu there on Tyrael. Right, they have already gone against this one. They know that they have to keep that creep pushed back at all times so that they can't start losing the vision war, especially as now it's Lunara versus Zagara. Look at that. Wow, wow. I, I think some people popped on the box hype train after that last series. Oh, Goat able to teleport just in time to avoid and bait out that uh, Ancient Spear from Sonya. So no pick just yet. And I'm wondering how this early game will go. A lot of times in the early game, the last set, it was uh, very low on kills until we got to a certain point. Then the opponent would pull ahead of Vox. We got uh, to the maybe 13 point, and that's when we'd see Vox be able to strike back. We'll see if they're able to do that again, or if they're gonna try to make sure they don't get behind versus Gale Force, which I think would be pretty pivotal. Wow, that is where Tracer comes into play against those heroes like Lunara and like Zagara. They saw those two picks, and that is exactly what they're looking to do, is get to that back line and put the pressure on. And that's something Gale Force is going to have to be very careful of. And I, I really like Cursed Hollow for a hero like Tracer because it's up to her to basically get around, get to that backside, and then also use that recall to get to a safe area. And I think the structures and the landscape of this lends a lot to that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point that you make. The landscape allows you to make sure that when you recall, you're back in the safe spot for sure, as that's not always the case for a lot of places. But now, once again, Hosty trying to 1v1 Crow in here, gets the Sticky Bomb on Crow in, sticks him with the Pulse bomb, but not quite enough damage yet to be able to take him out with that. But the threat is real. Almost taking down Lunara, almost taking down Zagara. Mm -hmm. Those are what you have to watch out for as Rafflecopter and Michael Yudal now moving in, trying to get this camp. The first tribute will be spawning very soon. They're going to try and get some early advantage out of picking up these camps, but in return, Goat Nuther pushing down this bottom lane. I want to go back to the vision point because it is such a concern for Vox and Healy this game as before they had Wisp where they could try to counter the creep vision that Zagar provided to Gul'dan's game. This time, Gale Force has both of those, so they're going to have such great potential for vision. Um, we may see, we, did we see Peekaboo? We did see Peekaboo, so that will help out a lot with that when Brightwing phase shifts in. They are now the first tribute spawning up at the top. Try to bite it off his beacon. He's going to be on that bottom spot, but as you said, look at Box Nahili rotating around, trying to get that flank. They're starting to body him off, and Lex Uther trying to stay on point. But Zagara is down in the bottom, so the longer that Gale Force Esports try to make that fight go, the better, as she's starting to put some structure damage down on the towers there, even taking them out and moving toward the well there, too. Should be able to take that out. That would be a really great bonus for them early on in this game. 
You know, one thing I think we got to make sure that we pay attention to is the fact that Brightwing Falstead, that's double global mobility on this large map. The ability to turn a fight in, in an instant with those two heroes is something not to be underrated, but speaking of Ooh. turning a fight in an instant. Posty recalling out away from that poison damage. The Rafflecopter not yet getting first blood for his team, but the push rages on, draining these towers in the mid of ammo and putting some damage on it, looking for those level seven talents slightly ahead of them, but very close early game from these teams. So far, very even, Gilly. Almost level seven for both heroes as Vox the first to pick it up. Only one tribute. As you said, the early game may not necessarily be the most exciting on Cursed Hollow, but as the stakes get higher and higher when you talk about getting those curses, once you have those three tributes, all of a sudden you start to make plays that you wouldn't normally make. The bosses are there, stuff like that. So Cursed Hollow, oh my goodness. Ooh. Face melt, right wing melt. That'll be the first one <laughs> of the game. I wanted to point out, though, we have a very interesting talent choice for Hosty on Tracer. A lot of times you see Parting Gift at level four. It gives bombs whenever you recall out, but they're going for more of a risk versus reward status, getting untouchable. So the more kills he gets, as long as he doesn't die, it increases his attack damage. That's one, but can they actually pick up this tribute? Well, Michael Udall went down there. Is Sonya not going to be around for that? Gil Forrest realizes it's a five versus four. We're going to go ahead and back out. You talk about interesting talent choices. Wild Bigger was picked up for Lunar. That's that increased auto attack damage. And it's something that we see some people tend to lend when they see a Tracer on that back line. Those auto attacks can hurt a lot. So look for them to try and use that to turn on Tracer when she dives in. Yeah, it has really good synergy too with future talents, whether you want to get Starwood Spirit 16 to increase the range, or even Invigorating Spores to increase your attack speed once you use your crippling spores, then they're going to do more damage. And if you get the increased attack speed, you can do it very fast. And with a strong front line between ETC and Sonya, our Lunara player, Rafflecopter, may feel like he can take that, even though the Starward Spear is generally the safer talent choice to pick up at 16. Five and a half minutes in, Gilly, two tributes over to Box Nahili. And we talked about when the stakes get higher, that means that the next time this comes up, the next tribute, Gale Force is going to be forced to defend. They can't give up a curse this early, especially with 10 right on the cusp here for Box Nahili. But if this does tend to draw out, I'm actually, you know, you look at the positioning right now, you've got somebody like Falstead, you've got somebody like Brightwing. Do you tend to see those heroes kind of stay in the lane and try and soak that extra talent here? But they look like they're ready to fight. And they are ready to fight. They want to get this curse. They know they have bruisers pushing in mid too. Daihu jumping in to his L Druin while the rest of the team still just trying to move in. He's barely staying alive with the shielding. They take out Sagara. Tyrion will go down. Remember, he's doing a lot of damage, so he zones Rafflecopter way more. That's another kill. That's more stacks for Hosty. They're going after Michael Udall. Zeus barrel rolling aggressively and four kills for one for Fox Nahili. That was huge. Even in death, the talent pickup for Tyrion. We saw it just off screen, able to do that damage on Lunara for the follow up. That is a huge win. They get level 10, they get the curse, and now it's time for them to make some things happen. Well, making things happen, they're starting with the bottom fort. Posty and Goat are there. The rest of them, a couple members going back. Of course, Tyrael respawning as he comes in. If they can take out down this fort, the rotation might be to go to the bottom boss. The fall starts flying up to the top so that they can ensure that they're continuing to get some split soaking on the battleground. Looking at heroic abilities, it is Lu uh, Leaping Strike again for Lunara and Devouring Maw this time. So the panel was right. We are going to be comboing Mosh Pit with, with the Maw, trying to zone people for a very long time, be able to separate them and take them down. Well, going in as Rafflecopter, he got baited out. They used Lee Ming as bait as Tracer waited in the bushes, and the minute he came out to use that Leaping Strike, gets the kill. So nicely done there by Vox. And the Polymorph from Lex Uther to slow him down so they could get that kill. Man, the stacking just is continuing for Hosty. It's a lot of attack damage if they're not able to start trying to take out Lunar or um, Tracer and reset those stacks. Can you imagine how big this would be taking game number one off a team like Gale Force? Now, I mean, this is still really early. But Vox looking really good right now. Six kills to two right now. Yeah. But let's remember, too, that Vox Nahili was behind the early game in every single game of the last series versus Full Dance game. That's not the case here. How can you feel momentum-wise when you know that you were behind in the last series, now you're facing Gale Force, and you're ahead in the early game? That's got to be a great feeling. But at the same time, when you get those momentum swings, when you start to know that you're doing really well, you have to make sure not to get too hyped because mistakes can happen then. The Wisp is out to keep Vision and Gale Force going in on the first boss of the game. Siege Camp picked up by 
Uh, Box Nahili as the boss is under assault, and now we see the rotation over from Box. Remember, Mighty Gust is there. The blink coming in. They aren't going to get on point, so the boss is going to be picked up in a three-man rush. The Mighty Gust not hitting there, and you can see the damage is going in, followed up by the Javaron Ball. Zoo's under a lot of pressure as we see the poison damage coming out. Two members down, but we do see Rhaegar go down, so no more heals, and we see Rafflecopter rotating around, looking to get more of that poison damage in, but Goat comes in as the power slide comes in, and Lex Luthor goes down on three for two trade, and now Goat seems to be the fourth to fall as soon as they finish it off, as Michael Udall says. Thank you very much. And now the boss going to get a little bit more value. Oh, Aka face the cleanse for Mosh Pit to make sure Gus won't interrupt it. Perfectly done and executed by Gale Force, just as we were talking about the early game being good for Boxy Healy. With one fight, Gale Force gets a four, a boss, picks up 13, and now is right back into this game. That is why they're good. <laughs> Gale, Gale Force knows how to make the plays, and they did just that. And, you know, they, they positioned themselves well. They had the boss control. They had the wisp out for that vision, and, and they played it perfectly. I mean, the fight got a little bit hectic, and, and they went in. But the fact that we see Tracer making the plays that Tracer is making right now, it, it's almost surreal. I mean, the fact that you take this and you look at Brightwing coming in with the face shield at level 7, it allows Tracer to really make those plays. You get the vision where you need it, and that little bit of shield allows him to be ultra aggressive. Tracer did die, though, so that's a great win for Gale Force. It's the untouchable stacks reset. And anytime you have something like that, right, where you're stacking, and the minute you're able to take down that stacking person, whether it's gathering power, untouchable, and the like, it's always a great feeling. It's a sigh of relief for a team, for sure. <laughs> 14 to 14 now, Gilly, and uh, zero tributes for either team. It's just a matter of uh, do they just kind of hit the reset button? Do they kind of play it out, look for their rotations, or do they look to engage as Tracer just being an absolute terror there? Uh, just poking away, but Gale Force, they have no reason to force here. Right. They were not positioned. RNG favoring Falstad and Li Ming, who are already up at the top, so they'll get that tribute while Brightwing handles the push in the bottom. And meanwhile, Gale Force realizing that there is a push happening in the top from Falstad and Li Ming. They're going to try to trade out forts here, and they will get it. They're going to get that. This is uh, what oh. they planned for, but Zeus looking. The Mighty Gust is. is available. As you can see, Daihu very low, forced to use the Sanctification, but that is isolating everybody. Rafflecopter using the Leaping Strike to get to the safe side. The Mosh Pit is in again. Tracer already down. The Ancestral is going to get in there, and that is three members down for Box Nahili. It was a great mom for a Mosh follow-up, too. And you're right, Sanctification had to be so early there because Daihu was low. They had burned him down, making him use that. And again, with this three heroes down, Gale Force says, ah, there's a tribute spawning, whatever, Falstad, you can get that. We'll take this boss on your side that will push onto a keep this time. And uh, this is uh, a little bit backwards from what we've seen from Box. A little bit slow to start, dominating late, but it appears that we have Gale Force trying to take that strategy. They realize, hey, we don't need that tribute. We're going to rotate to the bottom and instantly push in this keep, and this could potentially be the first keep of the game as the boss is now starting to rotate back. Looking at what Lunara has too, it won't be, it's actually going to be crippling uh, choking pollen this time. So not pairing something with Wild Vigor earlier on. Still want to make sure they have the greater spell shield and then having extra damage when you use the Noxious Blossom on a target that's already hit by the poisons. But there again, Zeus flying in to use the gust. Sanctification hitting more people this time, including Hosu who gets back in there just in time. The Seismic Slam still makes sure that Hosu will go down. Tracer having such a hard time in these fights. Akaface under assault. He's going to go down, which means there are no heals left as Michael Udall and team trying to stay in. Sonia does finally go down. B-Kid going to be the next to fall. And Rafflecopter not able to do enough damage to Zeus. The heals by Brightwing is keeping the team alive. The boss in the meantime, though, Gilly did take down the keep. One keep down, even though it, it was Vox and Healy who had a curse. But they are still on curse point again. They still can hope to get a curse and try to limit some of the structural damage that's been done to them. They got a full team wipe, but what have they been able to do with it so far? They are going to get the tribute. They're right in line to get that, trying to push back this bottom lane with the two global heroes they have. Got the curse, Gilly. They do. They, they've completely controlled the tributes. Gale Force has sacrificed them at times to get something for their own, but at the same time, this is now curse number two, and after that team wipe, this is potential for them to try and get a little bit of push. They got good value out of it earlier. All the forts are down on the map. It's just a matter of how aggressive do they want to be right now. Top boss is up in just a few seconds, 10 seconds until it's available. So, Box and Healy do have some options, 
But of course, with this curse, they want to push. If they can take down the keep in bottom, it means that their uh, catapults will just push against the other catapults too. So they don't have to worry so much about that land. That would be very great for them. Want to get the giants here for the push, but Gale Force are not going to let that happen so easily. Yeah, they're committing, and there comes the mosh pit out already. Zeus just trying to do damage as the Mighty Gus finally there. Sanctification has been used, and the damage the Ancestral does not land on time, Gilly. Holy ground, perfectly timed to separate out the team. Two kills already for Vox, and they are not letting up just yet. Hosty securing one more kill. Crowen getting out with like 50 health, so, so low. But with this three people down, now Vox, in, in the last few seconds of this curse, can take down a keep. They are threatening big time. The mm -hmm. recall right during the middle of the leaping strike by Rafflecopter. They're posturing for core. They are on the backside of this keep. Are they going to go in here, Kelly? Still 20 seconds, 20 plus for the rest of the heroes. Ma is up. Shielding there. They have healing, but pretty low on health. There is the leaping strike. Ma pulling two people in 10 seconds until they have more health. I don't know if this is going to be able to happen. This is a lot of damage from the two members of Gale Force left. Rafflecopter jumping over. He goes down, but so does Brightwing. This is it. The core falling. It's 30%. So many members of Fox left on the core. And Fox the Healy winning game number one this time versus Gale Force Esports. Can you believe it, Gilly? Look at him. They are so confident. Zeus on the left there feels so good about that victory. Game number one. Who would have thought this was going to be how the winner's bracket played out? They're a little bit excited for one game. How could you not be excited <laughs> after that? That was so great by Vox. We said, wow, they, they definitely had an upset over Gale, or, uh, Gul'dan's game. But here with Gale Force, very incredible showing from them. I want to hear what the panel has to say, Kolaris. Thank you very much. Wow, wow, wow. What a game to start this series off. Vox Nihili bringing the fight to Gale Force Esports with not exactly the most traditional comp either here, Dunk. That composition was insanity, Kolaris. There was so much mobility, yeah. so much drive on the back line, but it didn't look like it had the meat to win team fights. But we saw in that late game team fight, as soon as Gale Force engaged without their huge heroics, without the Mosh Pit, without the Devouring Maw available, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden the chaos that could ensue and the split team fight was a huge, huge advantage for the Vox Nihili chaos composition. Yeah. I mean, that Mighty Gust that pushed them all into that bottom keep and then the sanctification to just make them all invincible alone was so very clutch, but you can see even pre-level 10, they're going in, bringing the pain, forcing the Mac on their side of the map. Dunk, I mean, just the early game in general, what were you feeling with this composition? Well, it's you're totally right. The early game does have something to be said. Okay, gotta call out the cleanse. They mentioned in the cast, but that cleanse was very clean by Rhaegar to interrupt the Gust. Did result in their team winning the fight, but this is what I'm talking about. The Sonya here just does so much damage. Anytime she gets to connect with any target, she mauls them. Tracer, in the middle of that fight, one Lunara strike, one Sonya slam, pretty much dead, has to blow E, ends up in the mosh pit. And then, every time they clash, it seems like the Sonya is getting so much work done. But this fight, look at the cooldowns are still on cooldown for Gale Force. Those huge cooldowns, the 100 second cooldowns, 120 second cooldowns, just take forever to come back. And they engaged underneath that bottom keep. And it was really good of Vox Nihili to capitalize on the difference in cooldowns for those heroics. They all have 60 second or less heroic cooldowns. Gale Force, 120 second Mosh Pit, 100 second Maw. Absolutely beautiful for Vox and Healy to realize they could actually take that fight because of the cooldown differential. Yeah, there were cool moments as well, like where obviously Lunara has a little bit more mobility than most heroes when it comes to just off mount. Uh, but it was really negated. You know, there was moments where it was completely negated. Tracer really doesn't care at all. She'll just run you down anyway. And likewise, Falstaff's not too bad at dealing with it too. So Lunara lost one of her main components in some of these instances uh, that did kind of work out. So GFE down one game now. Surely at this point, you've kind of rattled the bear. I know it's not Misha, but you've rattled the bear. You've got to do, like, They've got to be angry about this. Well, I mean, I know Gil Gilforce is not expecting to go down in, in this series. They weren't expecting to lose a map in general. Mm. I mean, I was talking to Raffle, and he's like, wow, I really didn't expect to fa face Vox and Healy, but, you know, that's okay. We'll beat him. And yeah. just pure confidence for good reason, because Gilforce looks so dominant in their first series. And even versus Gul'dan's game, Vox and Healy, although they won in the end, it was, it was very close. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily a clean, clear victory from them. So to be able to take this first game off... I mean, does, is this when we see Gale Force pull out their true super secret strats, or do you think they're going to go full standard here? I think if you're Gale Force, you don't go crazy yet. It is still in the group stage. 
Mm -hmm. You still have another life, even if you lose this match. They don't expect to lose the match, but still, you can play standard and win. You just have to play cleaner than they were. The problem wasn't that they're con they got outdrafted. The problem wasn't that they played super bad. They took one bad team fight, and then Fox and Healy just did a perfect job of capitalizing on it. They got the curse, and they rolled. So mm -hmm. it's all about trying to refocus uh -huh. and not being overconfident, making mistakes, trying to take too much advantage with what you get. Well, the next map is going to be Tomb of the Spider Queen. Um, I think GFE probably has options here, some involving hoops, who would know? Uh, but obviously, they like that a bit more on other maps. But it is certainly possible here. Of course, though, if Kerrigan is able to get through, still a bit of a powerhouse on this map. We're going to go into the draft now and see what they're actually going to bring to the table. Falstad and Kerrigan do get banned down. Vox and Healy realizes it's quite a substantial threat on this map. Absolutely. The Kerrigan man makes perfect sense on this map, given that Gale Force's first pick you don't want to have to deal with the Kerrigan on this map. The fact that she just dominates rotations, she blocks off so many of your pathways in the early game, it's just difficult to play with against. Alrighty, well, Gale Force, we've seen them play a lot of Illidan. Illidan was the ban in game number one, but honestly, with Grey Mane, Tyrael, you know, all being really strong options here, well, going straight out of the gates for the Zagara. Uh, on the side of Vox and Hill, you think they're gonna lock in that Grey Mane Tyrael? It seems like the default response. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure it's great on this map, right, because right. this map really does prioritize wave clear, lane control, and the thing is, those two heroes are amazing. Tyrael, Greymane, both fantastic, but between the two of them, you lose out yeah, on a lot yeah. of potential lane control. Mm, gotta be careful with that for sure. Vox nearly as their two picks are about to come in. Yeah, just taking the sweet time about it. They've had some good success with Tyrael. Um, it was a little bit unfortunate for Tyrael in some of those situations in the previous game. He, like, Eldruin's mired into a mosh pit. Sad times, well, just before the mosh pit was going to strike, but it will be ETC to start things off, Jake. Alrighty, well, ETC here, you know, just very, very rock solid for that front line and the rotations. You know, they, they have played Greymane plenty. Every team does have a Greymane mm, at their disposal. Yeah. It seems crazy to even consider someone else. What would what else would you think would be a strong first pick here? Well, on this map, the Kale Thoth is a little better than usual. We've seen him fall out of flavor, mm. but given that he has extra value on this map due to his wave clear contribution, I could see foregoing some damage choices and picking up maybe an Uther here, securing that combination with the ETC, and then maybe later you can rotate into that Kael'thas, pick it up on the cheap end of the draft, rather than using this prime pick position on a Grey Mane, who struggles a little bit on this map. Ooh. Thrall, also an excellent pick in my opinion, just to have something to deal with Zagara. You have to remember, yeah, yeah. that's the last opportunity Vox and Healy will have to pick before the second band phase, and we've consistently seen Thrall getting banned out in situations where he might be good, in the second band phase. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's not many more choices they would have to contest with that. And even if he did, it's like weaker choices because Thrall, we all know how powerful he is in at least coping with the kind of lane situation the Zagara puts him in, you're right. So Jake, what are you expecting here really from Gale Force Esports? They've got the Zagara already locked in. Yeah, I mean, Zagara lets them go pretty much wherever they like. Uh, honestly, Tyrael seems like a strong pickup here, but I don't know. I mean, Gale Force is a team that can bust out any any kind of st style throughout this event. Tomb of the Spider Queen, they are known for the Asmo Den. Would they go Asmo with Zagara? Definitely could work because the flexibility exists. If but just um, have him in the top lane, mid lane, while Zagara just babysits the bottom, it could go. I if feel like just look at ETC Thrall, though. That's enough yeah. pressure, enough lockdown to really commit to that Asmo Den and try to slow him down. Absolutely. Looks like Gale Force thinks the same thing. They're gonna go ahead and pick up a Li Ming here. Little bit of a concern for me right now because I think you can still go Zool actually on Vox and Healy's team. You can end up putting Thrall in the solo lane and then putting Zool in your rotate on the rest of the map. Mm -hmm. You'll end up putting a ton of pressure on with the ETC plus the Bone it's true, Prison. Yeah. It's a lot of threat. You'll have infinite wave clear. And then you add on the Kael'thas that you can expect to pick up in the late draft phase. And that looks like a dominant composition to me. So I'm a little concerned about picking Li Ming here, which can get blocked by those skeleton summons so easily. Mm. Uh, it's definitely something we do have to consider here. They may end up banning it. Uh, it might be one of their prime picks for that. Uh, coming forwards. Do they go into a support here? Maybe an Uther? Oh, a Muradin joins Whoa. the fray. Interesting. 
We have not seen any Murden at all today, if I'm not mistaken. Not today, no. Once or yeah. twice yesterday. We, yeah, we saw him yesterday. I, I think he's sweet on this patch. I'm a big fan of the give him the axe build with the Thunderclap healing static. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's just a magnificent synergy where he kind of power spikes every tier. 13, 16, he gets so powerful. 20, even more powerful. That or you even go heavy impact against an ETC if he doesn't have a uh, divine shield with him and you can actually interrupt the mosh pit. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I like that pickup for Gale Force, but even when we were playing a lot of Muradin. I feel like on this map, it's a little it's a little difficult to get the lane control if Muradin's in your four man mm. on the top side of the map, just because he brings not that much wave clear on his own. He's only mildly threatening in the early game. So if Fox and Healy chooses to go with that Zul style, they can definitely be scarier and have better rotates. The Uther ban makes some sense to me for Fox and Healy. If they're not interested in picking it up, then them banning it forces the Rhaegar ban potentially out of Gale Force. Mm. And uh, yeah, I don't know if they'll ban the Rhaegar, but at the same time, that just gives Vox and Hilly the free Rhaegar if they don't. They can at least predict that hero is being locked in here for that opportunity. What other heroes do you think could be banned out here? The double the double warrior, is that enough of a threat? Do you think they would look to pair up that Sonya with the ETC for just a really scary frontline in those rotations? Or is just having that Thrall too much for the frontline? Yeah, I think the Thrall is just too much to add the Sonya onto that. It's one thing, Zul, where you're looking to try and 4-1 split and just dominate the lane control. With the Sonya, you're not looking for that. Sonya kind of competes with Thrall for the solo lane position. Gale Force does go for the Grey main ban, which is really interesting because that hero went much later in this draft than any other draft we've seen so far. Yeah, very much so. It's either been like first bans phase or definitely in first rotation. Anywhere else has been uncommon. It's the second orc for Vox Nihili, so they're going full hard at the moment. It seems like Gale Force had something planned here. They went with Zagara. Okay, totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. Leeming Muradin. Those are both kind of uncommon at this event, at least kind of, that yeah. early in the draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if they have something specific they're looking to run, and this is kind of setting up for it. The Greymane maybe doesn't fit into their composition, and that's why they banned it. Don't they have to be kind of careful now with the Sylvanas on the side as well? There's Sylvanas Thrall, which has a lot of power early game. Of course, he has Zagara to kind of deal with things alone, but elsewhere, don't they need a little bit more oomph behind them early game, Gale Force? Absolutely. Gale Force has to get something to deal with Wave Clear right now. Yeah. Leeming, not the Wave Clear champion, huh. and Muradin as well, not a Wave Clear champion. The Tyrael pick. Huh. This last pick has to be something. Fantastic. I mean, I'm trying to think of like <laughs> what that support would be, though. Uh, I really don't know. Their damage is going to be very light. It is definitely going to have that the dive potential to just try to seclude one target in the back. But it's not even like the back end of, of Vox Nihili is super weak. Sylvanas is slippery enough on her own right. I and mean, maybe Karazine for seven sided, like looking at this. Yeah, oh, but it's going to be Brightwing. Hmm. So. Gale Force looks like they're going to have a lot of trouble in the early game to me. They yeah. don't have a good way to manage the waves on the opposite side of the map from Zagara during the early game. And Brightwing's just not really that. They'll have just enough maybe if they can connect all of their hero's abilities on right. the wave, but they don't have a Johanna. <laughs> they don't have a Flame Strike. They don't have anything that deals with it. So Rhaegar, Lightning Shield on ETC, ETC walks in the wave. Sylv plus any DPS will absolutely eliminate the wave instantly, yep. and then they can rotate. And if at any point Gale Force falls behind, Box Nihili can abuse them by getting onto a wall because Gale Force doesn't really have kill pressure in the early game. Ooh. And a Kale Fast rounds out Vox Nihili. They have so much in terms of these lane controls. Yeah, as if, as if they needed more <laughs> lane clear. I mean, Kale Foss is just a, a monster for that here on this map. This is looking interesting. I mean, although Gale Force's composition might look unorthodox, these are all heroes they're very comfortable with and have their own very big power spike with, you know, the, the big maul landing in or, or clutch sanctifications. They can very well uh, dismantle the, the, the hard engage of the Sundering and pretty much everything at the disposal of Vox and Helium. Maybe Gale Force was just so impressed with the Brightwing that they're like, guys, guys, Brightwing is the best healer now. <laughs> it but is we're Aka just going to run solo healer Brightwing. Exactly, Jake. It's Aka Face. We both I mean... said it at the same time. It's <laughs> Aka Face, of course. But um, we're in game two, and normally I'd be like, oh, okay, GFE's done this draft. Yeah, they're one game up. But they're not one game up. 
<laughs> Vox nearly is one game up in this series. Right. And they have what looks like a bit of a blistering draft compared to GFE. Right? Absolutely. This draft is spicy, you might say, from Vox and Healy. Ooh, ooh, they spicy. are going to be coming out of the gates fast and furious, absolutely lighting up the minion waves mm. on the top half of the map, meanwhile relying on Thrall to just hold the Zagara at bay. Yeah. And the thing is, when you have Sylvanas, you can snowball an early lead better than probably any other hero in the game. Especially in Tomb. Absolutely. So just a couple turn-ins, pre-10, and the game will be wide open in Vox Nihili's favor. Yeah, it, it, it does look quite scary here for what we peg as the favorites of the group. I mean, they still have the potential to execute this right. They still have that potential. At least there is Brightwing there for the Polymorph, if ETCs to get like a good mosh pit and things like that. But there's so much power behind this. Jake, I mean, do you echo the sentiments here of, of Dunk? I'm a little worried about the early game of uh, Gale Force. I truly uh -huh. am. It's just Vox Nihili has so much control. They're, they're going to be so much quicker on the rotations left and right because of the lane clear. And they're the ones that are going to be really able to control the rotations and the, the pacing of the game, forcing Gale Force to respond to them. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take a look at who is playing what here in game number two for Vox Nihili going up against Gale Force Esports. And at the moment, the current reigning North American champs are on the ropes. Who are we looking out for here, Dunk? Well, of course, you have to keep an eye on Crohn's Li Ming. Everyone oh, yeah. knows that. And Gale Force looks strong in the late game, but. I really want to keep an eye on Goat and Daihu if they have that ETC Kael'thas synergy that provides the scary early game and will allow them to snowball. You know, in the last game we saw Lex Uther play Brightwing without cleanse. Is Akaface going to do the same versus an ETC? It could be ballsy. Who knows? Akaface is going to have to really make that Brightwing work here. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Keep an eye on the crow and on Lee Ming. Don't blink or you'll miss it. We're sending it over to Gillyweed and Jehao here for game number two. Vox Nahili one game away from sending uh, Gale Force Esports back to the deciders match and being able to get out of their groups and more importantly, potentially not having to face Naventic in the semifinal phase, which was will, where the winner will go here. I think that's a pretty decent incentive to go ahead and say, hey, let's go ahead and get yeah. the win here. That's not <laughs> bad. You know, I've been so impressed with Vox Nahili as we look at the games before. It's almost like they're the team fight bullies. I would kind of like to see them go against Naventic and watch those two teams duke it out. But game number two here between Gale Force and Vox. Gale Force, what are they going to do to try and even this up? One thing I want to point out, too, that Vox and Healy has told me before is Tomb is their best battleground. This was their choice. This is where they wanted to bring Gale Force to in this series. Whether or not they were able to win the first game, they felt confident here, and I can see why as the Gravity Lab picks up Michael Udall, and he won't be able to jump back to Eldrona in time. The explosion damage hits Daihu, but he stays alive through that first kill. He does have even in death, but that was ETC, and he's got a little bit more health than most, and not able to secure that kill, but man, Vox Nahili, uh, this is a little bit different than Ooh. what we saw last time. A lot of people were on the vi the box train, but uh, now we see Kale Thoss oh coming in. Oh my face. goodness! Gale Force cannot get rattled here. They know that there is a composition that is going to win the rotations. The panel mentioned it, and especially because there is an ETC Kale Thoss combination that will kill people if they catch people like that. They can't let Vox and Healy continue to do that. If I wanted to say, hey, guys, I want to start really well on this map, I would say, hey, let's go take a tower with Sylvanas. Let's come down and get a few kills during rotations. And uh, let's try and battle Zagar on the bottom lane. And so far, I think uh, they're, not, they're not doing too bad as Fox in the healing. All right, Rafflecopter at least is being a good bully. But Muradin now drops two. We're one minute, 30 seconds in this game. And Fox has gotten three picks. They're almost a full level ahead of Gale Force. And that lends itself to trying to get that double turn in phase right around seven or eight. That allows you to get the second one around 10. And with Sylvanas, think of the damage that that can do looking ahead to the team fights in this game. I mean, one of the biggest things that you look at out of those rotations is the fact that a lot of times you see very early on the rotations, everybody kind of shares the same amount of gems between both teams. But right now, it's a total of 10 turned in, 25 in the bank, and then only 18 for Gale Force. And they're just trying to, they're going to have to play catch up right now. Lex Uther going in. There's the rest of the team putting the pressure on Akaface again with the Gravity Labs hitting Beacon. I mean, they are rotating and putting the pressure on tremendously. Lex Uther reminds me of another support player who is body blocking out of his mind on Rhaegar. And that support player is Tiger the Tank. Do you remember him from E-Star? 
at the Summer Global oh, Championship. Yes. I'm like, wait a minute, in North America? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I love seeing when Rhaegar is that aggressive. I hope we'll continue to see that from Lex Uther. But Towers taken out using Sylvanas to her full potential. Thrall probably still not having a greatest time with this infest Zagara to make those ranged minions do more damage. Yeah, she's almost taken down the towers just by herself, but still the team is getting a lot out of it. They're getting a lot out of everything. Their rotations are on point. We've seen a massive amount of diversity from their, their hero choices. I mean, right now, Vox and the Healy coming in, we looked at the underdog, but I mean, it's just one of the things, Zoo's down here at the bottom, Michael Udall trying to look to possibly get a pick. Rafflecopter coming back in. Let's see if it's Fool's Goldie jumps in a little bit early, that extra movement speed. They're not gonna be able to secure that kill though. Yeah, not quite able to body block him to get a kill of their own. And sending two people down there, they see that in the people up in top for Vox take out another tower, furthering that experience advantage, trying to get their level seven talents. It's like every time, said, fine, you go down there, we've got Sylvanas, we'll take some structures down. And they've done that. They've done that in every single lane or in the top two lanes so far. And the rotations are on point. They're almost level seven. They have enough jumps to turn in. Let's see if they try and force the advantage the minute they hit seven to get that first turn in or whether they're going to hold on to it and continue these rotations. And the wave clear for Vox. Can't talk about it enough. Yeah, they've lost the bottom lane for sure. The tower's there for Zag, but they've gained towers in both mid and top, which has given them that experience advantage along with the three kills they've gotten. But Guild Force is starting to stabilize, right? They haven't lost anybody uh, yet. Now they have. Sorry, Never Kelly. Mind. That was trying. That's really big to take her out, too. That's huge. I mean, you talk about that creep. It lends so much as the power slide follow-up. This is what you're talking about. And now we have the, the Brightwing coming in to try and ward it off. And now can they turn it down as Brightwing coming in from Agaface? But Michael Udall barely gets away with about 70 health. He has that extra movement speed on Smite. But he turns around and takes that damage. He's going to try and get the even in death. And he pops it, but not enough follow-up as the orb just misses. Lex was just waiting until Feral Lunge was off cooldown. He's like, come on, come on, jump on him, take him down. So they trade out one from one, and in taking out Zagara, you're right, Vox was able to push back that bottom lane a little bit. And finally, Web Weavers here, that will be doing a lot more damage since they have taken out towers earlier on. It's so threatening. It is. Kel'Thas ETC, we saw it so many times at the Summer Globals in Sweden and then it kind of tried to be replicated, but the meta is so diverse. It's still a threat, there just happens to be more heroes. Sylvanas, as you said, as the guys on the panel said as well, you can snowball this. I mean, look at the amount of damage it's allowing, just Sylvanas locking out. First fort down in just over five minutes. That's a fort down, and they're just gonna rotate up. Brightwing is there, the top fort is taking damage. Brightwing moving back, knowing they're starting to come in. They have Sylvanas, but the Web Weaver was cleared up here, so they're okay with one for now, and Gale Force are not quite facing the 10 from Vox. It's a little bit of a window, a tiny bit, where there's not enough gems to for a second turn in right away from Vox. But Vox are still guarding this because they know that soon, very soon, they will have heroic abilities. Well, Gale Force trying to get some gems turned in. They finally have enough if they get it turned in by everybody. That's going to be a tall task, especially as we see Vox continuing to defend here. Uh, they're putting a little bit of pressure on Daihu, but. Are they going to come in? And as you see, uh, Hosty continuing to put the pressure on. I, these rotations right now, Gilly, I mean, the fact that they have a one-level lead already, they're about to hit 10. They should have enough gems to turn in here in just a moment, probably before level 10's hit by Gale Force. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're in a huge advantage right now. Gale Force moving back, knowing the window has closed as Vox pick up their heroic abilities right about now. And they were able to stall the few turn-in attempts. So with that, as you said, 46 now, they just need about nine more, and then they will get another turn-in and can start looking at some of the other forts, especially that top one, knowing that that's where the boss will push. They might not even wait for the Web Weavers. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no reason. Yeah. They have, they're so powerful right now. They have their heroics. It's such a threat, and Gale Force is left to do nothing but sit there and try and poke with Crowan, and that's, they're just like, yeah, whatever, I'm good. And meanwhile, ETC sat in the top turn-in point, making sure that nothing was snuck in. Thrall in the bottom one, too. And now they have enough if they can just get them turned in. Gale Force almost two heroic abilities. If they could just claw their way forward a tiny bit in experience, but not sure they'll be able to do it in time. They do have some good heroes for poking and being able to stop turn-ins, like Michael Udall as uh, Tyrael can do that pretty well with Eldurans, but 
They couldn't stall it out in time. Here comes Daihu too. There is a sanctification. They've been able to use that. They stunned Daihu Ma behind him. Ancestral healing keeps him alive, though. The Ma did not hit anybody. I think the Wailing Arrow was used right on top of that sanctification, so I'm not sure that they got anything out of that. They have some big heroics that are on cooldown. That Mosh Pit is huge, as well as that Wailing Arrow, but the next round of Web Weavers are on the board. Two forts down. They're aiming to rotate to the bottom as Michael Udall Got on the wrong side there. He's got to be very careful with his rotation now. Even though they didn't catch anybody with the Maw, Gravity Laps here on Michael Udo. He'll get taken out. Off face blinks to his teammates. Even though they didn't catch anybody, Living Bomb, like I that's said, be another careful kill. With the rotation. Oh, yeah. Um, even though he couldn't catch anybody, it dealed at least zones and people away while they were trying to deal with ETC. So that's a nice thing. They didn't lose too much, but they ended up losing two here as Web Weavers have been summoned. And that means that the push can get a lot stronger for Box here. I feel like things are starting to spiral out of control. Yeah. Like, Gale Force is just... The, what they're trying to do, Vox Nahili isn't having any of it. And the minute they're trying it, they're like, no, I, we're, we're the bullies here. And, and they've managed to bully every team fight so far. It's funny that you mention that, because I've talked to Daihu before a little bit about their bullying, and he said, we like to play like we're the bullies. We're not really. But if we are, if we're acting that way, if we're being really aggressive, it's because there is an objective we really, really want. We've seen that. They've been very aggressive about the turn-in points because they know as long as they keep control of the turn-ins with Sylvanas, they can do a lot more. Here comes the Sundering, though. The Phoenix is out, and that is going to do enough to zone. And once again, the Wailing Arrow was used maybe a little bit preemptively as they're not able to follow up. So those are two heroics that are now out, as well as the Sundering and Mosh Pit will be up soon. But all the heroics are on the board for Gale Force, and they are rotating up to try and get a turn in. Gilly, they desperately need this. They do need a turn in. They need to get some breathing room from Sylvanas, but they won't have 13 here, so this push could be less effective than they otherwise could have hoped for. But like you said, some key heroics are offline for Vox Nihili. They don't have Sundering for a little bit longer, or Willing Arrow, they do have Mosh, and that they lose, Michael here, that is one last person to push with these Web Weavers. He's been in some really compromising positions, and it's not paying off. And now we see Rafflecopter caught out. Devouring Maul was used, oh, and absolutely no, no follow-up whatsoever. Gale Force being picked apart. Nine kills to one in favor of Box. Yeah, Crowen trying to help his mid Web Weaver. Aquaface and B-Kid taking down some towers which at least will give them some experience while the rotations start to come in from Vox. They might have caught people too far up. They're going after Octase, but he can blink heal to be kid Very fast follow-up, though. Does he have the other charge? There's the other charge, and they get right wing away. A little bit of a juke there, nicely played by Octaface, but the damage is done. I mean, they're getting little to no value out of those Web Weavers. No they got forts. a little bit of st structure damage on the front line, but no forts are down. As you can see, the damage Li Ming doing plenty of it, but it's not effective at all. Four deaths by Michael Udall on Tyrion. And a gravity lapse off of the side. Another win to increase the range there. Is able to pick it up. Here comes Dayu with the mosh pit. And down goes Li Ming. No fear of reset. Vox the Healy cheering, going on, taking out Bright Wing 2. This is Vox's game to lose. What is happening? Gale Force is just crumbling under the pressure that Box Nahili is putting on them. And Sylvanas, there's no hesitation. The minute they get that down, those zeros down, they push right in. Devouring Maul, remember, is very is on a very long cooldown and still there. Beacon going in, but the return, gravity laps, the power slide in. They instantly turn on the Rafflecopter, and Brightwing not able to get it. Now he's trying to go in on Michael Udall, but the Ancestral is going to land. Beacon very deep in there, but Lex Luthor keeping his team alive, and Michael Udall is going to go down but once explosion. again. But there is the explosion, but not before Kael'thas was already taken down. Well, they at least get one kill, which does help a bit with experience, but still Vox two levels ahead, structurally in the lead, and Jim's in the lead, getting close to their third turn in. Boss is available, no side really wanting to go for that just yet. Instead, Vox doing such a great job of babying their lanes, knowing that that is the big advantage for their composition. They started with the early game rotations, having great wave clear, and they are continuing that on, knowing that every web weaver phase they get is maximized when they push the lanes out so Sylvanas can get right on structures. This is just unreal right now. I, this is not <laughs> the way I expected this series to go, but after, you know, we saw the boating 
in game number one, a lot of people were on Vox, and it was about 50-50 when it started here. I think a lot of people are expecting Gale Force to come back to show their strength. They have high aspirations, and right now, Vox is doing everything that they can to deny them. And it, it, I mean, as you said, I mean, if the winner of this avoids Noventic in round number one tomorrow. Right, and look at the experience. 16 is here for Vox, and they have, again, a talent tier advantage, a lot more damage, especially because we have Cold Embrace for Sylvanas. They can add that vulnerability, and with Kill Thoughts, they get Sun King's Fury. So the damage just increases and increases here at 16. They're very close to a turn-in. I wondered if they were gonna try to do the boss turn-in combo special, combo platter, if you will, <laughs> but they're just hanging out at the turn-in point here, making sure they have lanes pushed, and they're the Web Weaver's Descent. Well, I think Gale Force recognized that. They were doing everything that they can to clear out the lanes to force those Web Weavers to spawn as far back as possible. So they've cleared that out a little bit. They bought themselves a little bit of time, but there's still a talent tier down. They're gonna have to defend once again. And you talk again about Sylvanas and Kael'thas pushing in. I mean, that's just ultimate wave clear, whatever lane that they choose. I want them to be very aggressive with this. They have 16 advantage for a long period of time and they had to turn in all of their gems now for this one, so it'll be a long time until they have another. Web Weaver with top, they know this is the most important lane on Tomb because of the boss positioning. They take out towers, Web Weaver's still very healthy. Sylvanas can lightly go in, make sure she's throwing down when she can to take out the structure, make sure it's not helping with the defense of this, and they're even blocking some of the leaming damage. Just try to take out this keep with this push. Yeah, they're committed right now, they're continuing the push. The Phoenix was there to zone, but it was nicely blocked with a stun down on the bottom, singling out Rafflecopter once again. Devarian Maul is there. Nice blink in, but the Mosh Pit is out. The Ancestral does land on time. The Sundering in return is going to split them up. The fort, or excuse me, the keep not down yet, but Beacon gets power slid on, goes in, and it's a trade, but that is not what Guild Force needed as they continue to try and put the pressure on. Kron looking for those resets, not able to get them. No, but they protected the keep. The Go, Go was trying to bait them out, right? He was looking for another gravity lapse. They know if they can hit one of those, they can still take them out, but they're not done yet. They might have lost ETC, but look, bottom Web Weaver has taken out towers. The mid keep nearly down. They have done significant damage with this Web Weaver push. Looking at the minimap, Gilly, I mean, the amount of structures that are down on one side of the map versus the other, Red is so fragile right now, and that's Gale Force Esports. They now find themselves down a level and a half. The only saving grace for them is that, as you said, before that started, all the gems had to be used for that last turn in. They have 22. This is an opportunity for Gale Force to either try and force a fight before 20 or try and find some way to get some map control back. Right. They are heading out to the battleground. They're going to start the turn in for Rafflecopter. Get the gems away from them that they can so they don't lose them if somebody goes down too. But they would like to ideally get them turned in first, but there goes Daihu again. Follow-up from Goat has been so good. That sanctification was out of position. Daihu so low, he manages to get the cell peel and stay alive. I mean, it was like... Akafe said, I dare you to come in. I'm coming in and I'm gonna be just fine. I'm just gonna dare you to make a move. Except he did, he played with fire, literally and figuratively, and uh, he got burned. That's a great reference that you make there because Kale Fox, I get it, yeah. The fires are real, <laughs> as is this boss pressure because now with no support here, double warrior, what do Gale Force do? They do have Ma, they don't have Sanctification. Oh, this is a tough spot to be in, Jay How, here we go. Michael Udall very low on the bottom end. He's trying to get back in. He does sacrifice himself. He's going to try and get a little bit of damage. He does get the kill onto Thrall, or at least somebody does in there. But Tyrion to trade one for one right now. And Hosty, there's that heavy impact coming in to get that stun to help secure kill number two. And Gale Force is managing to stay alive. They stop the boss pickup. They still have gems to turn into. And with two kills on big damage dealers, finally, that will be a turn in for Gale Force. Very, very important here. They send Brightwing back to protect that keep. They still haven't lost a keep, so it's so good. They're not having to deal with catapults while all of this long brawling goes on. It allows them to at least clear up the lanes and start to regain some semblance of map control. They'll definitely be able to get some structure damage in, but you can see Brightwing in the bottom trying to allow that to push up and go. There's also no Sylvanas help for 20 seconds for this defense. Which means that you can't, you know, you can't just stall out some of the minion waves that go along with the Web Weaver. And with this fort being so low, 
it's a little scary for Vox and Healy to try to defend at the fort here. So they're gonna have to let it go, move back. Brightwing, meanwhile, is doing her split push thing best, helping out the Webweaver in the bottom. This will surely get this fort. Just opening up this map for them to get these forts down allows them to manipulate and maneuver around the map in a little bit more aggressive positioning. Right now, they've pretty much had their backs to the wall this entire game, and now they're starting to turn it around. They are by no means out of the woods just yet. Level 20 getting closer, the Phoenix getting the zone. They're like, hey, we gotta get out of here. Yep, that is it. The end of the top web weaver with only minimal keep damage taken by Vox. Rotations to finish. The other web weavers have started for Vox, but Gale Force Esports in taking out both of the forts that were up got some of their experience out of the bank and caught up here. So they're right behind Vox for Storm Talents. How crucial does that save of that top keep look right now? You called it. The fact that they're able to put this type of pressure while allowing the structures, as far as what's standing, is basically the same now. All keeps are still up, and just like that, look at the experience. It's so close. Gale Force has managed to claw their way back with those last two picks, and now this looks like a completely different game. A pretty even match at this point, even though it was 17 kills to five, like you said. They have caught up. They no longer have to worry about talent tier advantages. They have all their big heroic abilities. And while Vox are starting to turn in some of their gems, they're not quite at the point of having a turn in yet too, which means that they have to spend some more time in lanes. And that's a potential for Gale, for Gale Force to try to find a pick, or if they see them all on the bottom, uh -oh. start this out. You know what's cool? Daihu holding on to that level 20 ETC pick again. <laughs> we yeah. saw how that worked out for them before, and they're doing it again. And man, we see the rotation of ETC and company, but that ping it's at the bottom knows that they have the numbers advantage, and they are gonna get this boss with almost no contest. Nice rotation by Gale Force. Level 20 is there. They're looking to engage Gale. Might have to pick up Bolt here because he is in trouble. Power slides away. So there he goes, still holding on to his level 20. Not panicking as I would have if I had been <laughs> in that position, that's for sure. And this well, boss will help Gale Force bring down this keep. I mean, if they can get the first keep of the game, I mean, it's just like a huge turnaround right now. And they are going to try their best to poke. Phoenix is now out trying to zone whatever they can and they're gonna it, this keep this is huge it's a stun there onto etc and the huge magic missiles from growing coming in there on lee ming oh sundry for the side Zeus eliminates cigar just like that in great position polymorph has hit him though ancestor healing comes out they're continuing on off the face blink healing to safety on kerwin but leaving tyriel and b kid behind they will go down probably go down, at least Tyrael did. Oh, B-Kid is in all kinds of trouble. He's got that extra movement speed coming in. Nicely done there by Akafe's Hosi spinning valuable time as the Storm Bolt comes out, gives a little bit of distance. Akafe's is getting dove on the Gravity Lapse is gonna land. Are they gonna get the takedown? And down goes Akafe's. That is three members down. They have and now we see, we see B-Kid and Crow, they're going for the back door right now, Gilly. Oh my, B-Kid taking core damage though he can't do that. Hosi has come back. He's the defense. The keep has been taken down. They're starting to work on Gale Force's core. 84% is boxes, but Murden has been taken out. Hosty brings down Murden, takes out Crow in, and that will be it, j -Hal. This is huge. Box the Healy getting the 2-0 against Gale Force. The most unbelievable set. I mean, we are going to see taking down Gold Dance Game. The experience from Gale Force. This is huge. The earthquake has been felt in the North American scene, and it's the is Vox Mahili. They are so incredibly happy, cheering the minute, the minute they saw <laughs> that Murden had been taken out. The screams started and did not let up until the core was done. Fantastic showing by Vox Mahili here. I just, I'm out of my mind how amazing that they were able to take down Gul'dan's game. We already was like, that's a huge upset. And now Gale Force? Incredible. When it's time to fight, they waste no time at all. They have shown their dominance. Gilly, the final death count on this, 22 kills for Box Nahili, five for Gil Force Esports. That is not something we're used to seeing. We have seen so many types of compositions from Box Nahili already, showing they can pull out double warrior, but also playing this more standard style, being aggressive in the early game when they need to, or playing the passive game and still winning off of one team fight in the late game. 
it's incredible to see this team that, yes, does have experience, but we haven't seen them together at a land showing. It's Zeus's first land showing here. Uh, there was like no fear on the side of Box and Healy. I think that's what I love the most. The fact that they were able every single time, I, I think there's sometimes the fear factor of, hey, these are the defending North American champions. And you're like, wait a minute, you, you're almost hesitant to commit. There was no hesitation at any point. Every time they saw an opportunity, they seized it. They were the they were the hunter in this one. Gale Force was the hunted. Well, I cannot wait to hear from our victors again, Vox and Healy, especially who I know that we're gonna have for the interview because it's Daihu, the man with the mosh pits. Daihu, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. That's right. I'm joined by Dai Hu from Box the Hilly after a sick win in two games over Gerald Forest Esports. First of all, you guys came in as the underdogs in both of your matches that you won today. Now you're first in your group. So how does it feel, man? It feels amazing. I honestly didn't think we'd even qualify first. I thought we would have to make our way through the losers bracket, but everyone showed up today. We played spectacular and we came here to win. You definitely did. It was very apparent that you guys came here to win. A lot of hard work, I'm sure, went into it. Uh, let's start getting into the gameplay a little bit. I want to talk about uh, game number one. Uh, you guys came out with a really interesting comp. Uh, you played the Tracers, the first one of the tournament. Uh, talk to me about that draft, and talk to me about the, the Tracer pick as well, in particular. Well, the draft that they had in game one, they had a really weak uh, front line to stop us to go into their back line. Uh, we had the Tyrael and the Tracer, so we were just like, okay, just dive their back line, we'll kill them all. Uh, that was basically the plan. Yeah, and it definitely worked out. There was a couple times at the end there, you realized like the mall was down, you guys just went in and, and wiped them. So that was pretty sick. Um, uh, game number two, uh, I want to talk about that draft a little bit too, because that was a little bit interesting. Uh, like in the second half of the bands, you guys banned uh, Uther away and then picked up Rhaegar. Uh, what was the, the plan in that draft? What was just, just the overall strategy behind your draft there? Uh, we wanted a way to stop. So we, uh, the original plan was to put Akka onto Monk, because if we popped Asunder onto like their whole team, then he wouldn't be able to palm whoever we were trying to kill. And it would just be really easy, because uh, we just one-shot everyone with uh, ETC stun, with KT stun, and Thrall root. Yeah, and that, that worked out as well. You had some, some sick plays. Uh, the Falling Sword as well. I know we didn't get a chance to interview you after your first series, but uh, the Falling Sword, Johanna, was sick too. So uh, you guys are coming out in first place in your group, which means you'll play against the second place from the previous group. So that would be Murloc Geniuses. Uh, they had sort of a similar story as you guys. They came in as an underdog in a few of their matches. Uh, how do you feel going into that semifinal matchup tomorrow against Murloc Geniuses? I feel very confident. Murloc Geniuses would be a really good matchup. I respect everyone in their team. They're all mechanically good. They work really well as a team. I think it's going to be a really good match. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I know everybody else is probably looking forward to it as well. So congratulations, man. I'll let you go uh, celebrate with your team. Uh, we have more matches coming up, two more on the day. We are going to have to go to a quick break before we jump into them. But don't go anywhere. More Heroes of the Storm action right after this. Here's the stuns coming back in and the mosh are turning on this. last two events, this time with a new roster. We have Tiger, JK, and Goku. I think they'll be great additions to the team. The teams aren't necessarily as strong as they were before. Literally every single team made roster changes. So I think this actually puts us at a pretty good position because we have three players who remain the same. How Win and Buds able to absolutely deny that what looked like a beautiful play. I see this as an opportunity for a team name change to prove themselves to be one of the top North American players. TNC, they made roster changes and they're showing that it was absolutely the correct decision. I think half the teams uh, think we're weak and the other half think we're really strong. The teams that think we're weak can be uh, used as an advantage for us. We can easily capitalize on mistakes because they're underestimating us. As long as we're all taking it as seriously as possible and just trying our best. I think we're actually gonna change a lot of people's opinions about our team. 